1972, Mark Donahue lined up outside of row one at the start, but teammate Gary Bettenhausen set the pace. Donahue remained within striking distance as Bettenhausen led 138 laps. Late in the race, Bettenhausen slowed down and Mark Donahue wheeled his car to the checkered flag, winning the Indianapolis 500 for the first time. Hello, I'm Bob Jenkins. Mark Donahue came to the Speedway in 1969 with an Ivy League education and a background in sports car racing. Donahue's engineering expertise and superior understanding of race car setups helped break ground for a new breed of IndyCar drivers. Despite his short career, Donahue excelled in many forms of auto racing, broke the world close course speed record in 1975, and became a legend at the Indy 500, a race for heroes. Mark Donahue graduated from Brown University in 1959 with an engineering degree and a love for auto racing. He began driving sports cars that year, and though he didn't anticipate becoming a professional driver, he attracted the attention of Roger Penske. Penske was a recently retired driver who wanted to form his own team and needed a good young driver. Donahue really was a new breed. He was one of the first drivers who understood the car technically. You know, Mark had put it together. I think the vehicle dynamics, when we got into some aerodynamic areas, certainly the wings, camber change, things like this, Mark was at the leading edge of that. And I guess that uh, probably is fully committed to race drivers I've ever seen. Donahue joined the Penske operation and progressed quickly. By 1969, he was ready to challenge the Speedway in Indianapolis. Leading up to his first appearance at Indy, Donahue achieved success in Can-Am, Trans-Am, and Formula 5000 competition. He was an integral part of the Penske team, working long hours in the garage, helping any way he could to improve the team's chances on race day. When he first started racing, he used to work in a car himself. He'd, he'd take it to the track, unload it. He was, uh, he was quite a person. He, had, he worked with you all the time. I mean, it, it's not like the drivers nowadays. You see them, you know, they come in, they get fitted in the car, and they leave, and you don't see them, they get to the track. Mark lived it. He was here. Though the team had little experience at Indy, they had a competitive car, and Donahue quickly became comfortable on the two-and-a-half-mile oval. People said we had a very well-prepared car. As a matter of fact, some people said we had the best-prepared car since the Second World War, you know, when we showed up there. So we... We prepared well and we were not disappointed. I think we even we maybe even were surprised, you know, the way we got the showing we did. Donahue surprised many by qualifying for the inside of the second row. His speeds nearly matched those of 68 winner Bobby Unser, who drove a similar car. The pressures to perform at Indianapolis are great, especially for a rookie starting from the front of the pack. Donahue was in the company of three-time winner A.J. Foyt, defending Indianapolis and national champ Bobby Enzer, and future winners Mario Andretti and Gordon Johncock. Donahue dropped back, content to let the veterans fight for early position. Andretti took the early lead. But Foyt soon showed the form that earned him three previous wins at Indy. Slowly, Donahue worked his way into the top ten as Foyt battled with Wally Dollenbach, Lloyd Ruby, and Andretti for the lead. By lap 170, Donahue was up to third behind leader Mario Andretti. But Donahue was having problems. A ten and a half minute pit stop to replace a Magneto dropped him back to seventh as Andretti took the win. The Donahue was awarded Rookie of the Year honors. Donahue arrived in 1970 with a new car, eager to improve on his previous year's performance. In qualifications, Al Unser set the pace, putting the Johnny Lightning Special on the pole with near-record times. Johnny Rutherford and A.J. Foyt joined Unser on the front row with strong runs in the 170-mile-an-hour range. 
and Donahue again qualified for the second row, this time taking the middle position. It would prove to be his worst starting spot ever at Indianapolis. Winning the fabled Indianapolis 500 is a goal set by just about every driver who ever strapped on a helmet. In 1970, the motivation was even greater when the total prize money reached $1 million for the first time. Johnny Rutherford slipped by Al Unzer at the start. By the end of the first lap, Unzer regained the lead. Unzer easily paced the field, leaving Coit and Donahue to fight for second place. Donahue ran a consistent race, and with just 10 laps to go, he moved into second place. But Unzer showed superior speed, leading 190 laps, taking the checkered flag for his first win at Indy. Though Donahue finished 34 seconds behind Unzer, his technical expertise and driving abilities were drawing the attention of fans and the media. I think he was the first college-educated uh, uh, driver to appear in my years at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. An engineering degree, as I remember it, from Brown University, and we just thought that was extra special. That uh, here was a man who had gotten uh, a degree appearing at Indianapolis and with a fine background in sports cars, and again, he was impressive. Donahue showed the skills of a potential race winner, but team owner Roger Penske felt they needed a better car. For 1971, Penske obtained a new car from Bruce McLaren's operation. Penske's crew set up the new McLaren perfectly, and Donahue practiced at speeds nearly 10 miles per hour faster than the track record. Running speeds well ahead of Peter Rebson in the team McLaren car, Donahue was heavily favored for the pole. Donahue hoped to break the 180 mile per hour mark in qualifications, but he fell short, posting an average just better than 177. Later that afternoon, Revson posted the fastest times of the day to take the pole. It was considered to be a major upset. It was just a matter of going out and doing it and, uh, at the right time, and, and uh, we failed. I think other guys learned the last hours or the last day before the race, uh, before qualifying, they learned uh, what to do, and we, we, we kind of, you know, we stayed too conservative. Donahue lined up in the middle of the first row as the favorite on race day. At the start, he bolted ahead of the field, building a huge lead. had 50 laps before making his first scheduled stop. Back on the track, he regained the top spot on lap 65, paced the field for two laps, and suddenly pulled out with a broken gearbox. It was a disappointing finish, but Donahue would be back in top form in 1972. For the 1972 season, Mark Donahue was joined by Gary Bettenhausen on the Penske team. Bettenhausen was a hard-charging master of the dirt tracks who benefited from his association with Donahue. I remember like he, he taught me a long time ago, he said, you never take away from one end of the race car to make the other end work. In other words, you, you don't take traction away from one end. If the car is pushing the front end, you don't take traction away from the rear end to make the car go around the corner. You try to put more traction on the front rather than taking it away somewhere else. And it's just thoughts like that, things that you remember as the years go on, and you kind of live by those little rules, and it, it, it helps you. But he was, I think he lived for automobile racing. With Donahue and Bettenhausen, Penske had assembled a team of superior drivers, matched in talent only by the Parnelli Jones Super Team. Jones, the popular 1963 Indy winner, put together a team consisting of reigning national champ Joe Leonard, 70 and 71 500 winner Al Unser, and 69 winner Mario Andretti. It was a formidable lineup, but the new cars were not up to expectations, and the Parnelli Jones team struggled. 
In qualifications, Bobby Enzer smashed Donahue's one and four lap records by an incredible 17 miles per hour to easily take the pole. Peter Revson, driving the McLaren car, put himself in the middle of the front row with a solid run. Donahue completed the front row. His speeds were a tribute to dedication and hard work. I know he would uh, go testing or we'd go to a racetrack and at night while everybody else was out having dinner, having a beer, whatever, Mark would be in his room just all by himself thinking and concentrating on how to make the car better or to run faster the next day. Bentenhausen benefited from Donahue's influence by taking the four starting position and was joined on the second row by Andretti and Leonard as the Parnelli Jones team finally found some respectable speed. There is never a sure winner at Indianapolis, but every year there are several drivers who have better chances than the others. In 1972, that list of drivers included Donahue, Andretti, and Leonard. But as the field rolled out for the start, the odds-on favorite was Bobby Unzer, who won the pole with the biggest speed advance in 500 history. At that time, Bobby was almost unbeatable as long as he finished a race, but it was because, I mean, they were running the engine so hard. At that time, we were running unlimited boost, in other words, we could run any amount of turbocharged pressure to the engine that we wanted. <clears throat> and uh, it just seemed like Bobby had 150, 200 horsepower more than anybody else whenever he qualified. And, uh, car was very strong as long as it ran, but it didn't finish too many races. As expected, Unzer jumped out to an early lead. Before long, Unzer began lapping the field. His pace was too much for early challenger Peter Revson, who dropped out with gearbox failure. Unzer was the next out after only 32 laps. Gary Bettenhausen charged into the lead and held off challenges from Mike Mosley, moving up from the 16th position. Donahue, driving a patient, steady pace, pulled into the pits for his first stop. He was running in the top five. Bettenhausen also hit the pits, putting Mike Mosley in the top position. While leading on lap 56, Mosley lost the wheel and crashed coming out of turn four. His accident gave the leaders another chance to pit for adjustments or fuel. Bettenhausen returned to the lead following Mosley's crash with Jerry Grant second and Donahue third. Bettenhausen dominated, leading for more than 100 consecutive laps. On lap 162, Bettenhausen ducked into the pits, temporarily giving the lead to Grant. Grant made his stop a few laps later and returned to the track looking to challenge for the lead. With tight fuel limitations, Grant would have to be careful as he prepared for the final 30 laps. Penske's team was well represented with Bettenhausen in the lead and Donahue running third behind Grant. But on lap 176, Bettenhausen slowed dramatically with a mechanical problem. Grant took the lead, followed by Donahue in second. It would be a two-man duel to the finish. Grant was forced to run tentatively to conserve fuel and save his tires, allowing Donahue, who had run a steady race, to make his move. With Donahue applying pressure from behind, Grant took a badly needed pit stop on lap 188, putting Donahue into the lead. Leading the final 13 laps, Mark Donahue wheeled past the checkered flag to win the 1972 Indy 500. For Donahue, it was an emotional victory. He graciously accepted with the class of a true champion. He shared his rewards with people that, that uh, he'd grown to respect during that month that he spent here. And at that time, Al Strauss uh, gave a $1,000 wardrobe, I'll say, to the winning driver. And it was a... A big thing. You know what he did? He invited about four or five of us from the media locally to come along with him that day. And then he told each one of us to pick out something that, uh, that we wanted. Now that was Mark Donahue. It would be his last visit to Indy's Victory Lane.
Reigning champion Mark Donahue returned to Indianapolis in 1973, anxious to defend his title. Bobby Allison joined Bettenhausen and Donahue on the Penske operation, but once again, Donahue led the team in qualifying. Posting speeds nearing 198 miles per hour, Donahue qualified for the front row for the third straight year. Johnny Rutherford set new one and four lap records to take the pole. And Bobby Unzer joined Donahue on the front row as well. Weather did not cooperate for the 73 race as the first attempt was rained out following Salt Walter's opening lap accident. After one more day of rain, the drivers prepared in hopes of actually running the race. Finally, after three days of frustration, the field charged ahead to take the green flag. Bobby Unzer took the early lead, challenged by Donahue, Gordon Johncock, and Swede Savage. Donahue developed problems and dropped back as Al Unzer and Johncock battled for the top spot. And at 92 laps, Donahue dropped out with a burn piston. It proved to be his last Indianapolis 500. Seemingly at the peak of his career, Donahue retired from driving at the end of the 1973 season. I think he wanted to further himself and, you know, get more into the business end of it. And I don't think he realized just how much he was going to miss racing when he did that. I think anybody can retire anytime. And it's a sport that you're only able to do well as long as you have motivation to do well and as long as you have the will to win, to compete. If you don't have that, the best thing to do is to retire. Donahue returned to Indianapolis in 1974 to manage the Penske team of Gary Bettenhausen and Mike Hiss, but he wasn't happy as a manager. His interest was in driving race cars. Mark had so many things on his mind trying to run the, the race team for Roger Penske and uh, uh, I think that he felt that he had accomplished what he wanted to by winning the 500 and uh, he was satisfied momentarily but it's like anything else you after away from something for a while you want you find out how much you loved it and I think that's what brought him back out of his retirement even myself when I remember the day I retired from Grand Prix racing I had enough I was exhausted, I was drained out, and I said, I never drive again the racing car. But uh, I went back to Brazil, recharged the battery, I stay away from racing, and uh, I said, why well, don't go back now much stronger? I think sometimes you need that. That same year, A.J. Foyt set a new closed course speed record of better than 217 miles per hour at Talladega. Donahue began testing some cars for Penske. And in 1975, he went to Talladega in an attempt to break Voigt's record. You're running at such tremendous speeds, and the difference between 217, which is Voigt's record, and 220, which we're shooting for, is two tenths of a second. And in 2.6 miles, you know, that's not very much. We uh, uh, now have to warm up and then do the job. It's been a lot of work up to this point, and uh, a lot of people are looking for us to be successful and yet it has to be done. I can tell for sure it's not easy. On the track, Donahue looks smooth. Expertly wheeling the Penske car around the banked oval at Talladega, Donahue broke Foyt's record with a run of 221.16 miles per hour. Donahue's record-breaking run was just part of his return from retirement. That year he had already participated in Formula One races for Penske. He was thrilled to be back at a race car. <laughs> How was it out there? Well, it's, we've worked a long time to get to this point, and it's really a, it's a great thrill to have this kind of a record in, in the Penske racing team. I'm really, really happy. Tragically, Donahue's comeback did not last long. Practicing for the Austrian Grand Prix, Donahue's car crashed through a fence in pre-race warm-ups. I remember the day he got his crash in Austria. Um, is something that always be on my mind and uh, I was going towards turn one after the pit in, in Zeltweg, it's a very fast corner 
and I saw a yellow flag and dust. This was during practice. And uh, when I looked at the Amco, the outside was, was down like 45 degrees. It looks like someone launched itself and out of the track. And I, I slowed down and I didn't know what to do. And then I decided to stop the car and jump out and see if I could help. I saw Mark sitting on the cockpit. I was the first one to arrive there. And uh, he looked to me and said, uh, Amy, he called me Amy at that time, and said, Amy. Uh, I said, Mark, are you okay? He said, yes, yes, I'm okay. And uh, Hans Stuck, come and help me. We took Mark out of the car, and we walked all the way up the hill back to the track. And uh, he, he was fine, and uh, he talked to me. And then he got an ambulance and I never saw him again. It was, it was a very frustrating moment. Four days after his accident, Mark Donahue passed away. <music> 1969 brought the debut of a new breed of IndyCar driver. Mark Donahue arrived with an engineering degree and a technical understanding of the cars far beyond that of his peers but Donahue was more than an engineer. You know, they always said, well, he's a great engineer. Well, I mean, that was very unfair to him, I think, because he was obviously a damn good race car driver, too. Donahue's dedication to auto racing and his drive to perfect the cars always left a strong impression on his teammates and fellow drivers. His whole life was automobile racing and trying to perfect uh, a better race car and uh, his favorite saying was, uh, they have the unfair advantage is what made it easy to win races. He was a very nice person. He was not like any other driver you've ever met. He was part of the crew. He worked with you, he lived with you. I mean, when you hurt, he hurt, and vice versa. It's, uh, he was really nice. Well, Mark was uh, the guy that would work in the shop all night and go in, take a shower, and jump in the truck and drive it to the race. I mean, that tells you Mark down. He'd work all day, and then he'd be the one that'd sit on the pole and win the race. He was a complete race driver, and his whole life really became dedicated around racing, and he was a great motivator for me, someone I could count on. He was honest. He was, he was trying to see the team win. I think Mark probably was as much a team player as anyone I've ever seen because he knew the success of the team, whether it was uh, Gary Bettenhausen driving as his co-driver or George Fulmer in a Can-Am car. Uh, certainly Mark was a, was a team player. Mark Donahue, brilliant engineer and champion race car driver, became a legend at the Indy 500, a race for heroes.